It's going to be my pleasure to introduce uh, you to Sheila and John from Dublin, working together since uh, 1988, and they've received numerous awards for their form and vent of buildings. And their work, uh, for me, the, the work that I've seen, it, it exhibits a knowledge of the craft of building. It has a strong sense and understanding of place, as well as the rhythm and cadence of space. Uh, they work from first principles. Uh, the most recent example of their work is the, I keep on wanting to say Sea Saw, but it's Saw C Hock Student Centre at the LSE in London. Um, and that work was nominated for the Sterling Prize in 2014, and I think it's worth noting that Sheila and John have been nominated a record five times for the Sterling Prize. Let's hope that one day that they receive the attention and respect that they deserve. Just over a week ago, they received the RIBA gold medal in a dinner in London. And I learnt this from Neil McLaughlin, who was here last year as the Fortuna lecturer. And I found out that Neil was actually one of the nominators for uh, the RIBA gold medal. And he was a previous Sterling Prize nominee as well. And I asked Neil if he could give me an idea of some of the, his experiences of their buildings firsthand. And he sent me an email from the LSE the morning after the RIBA dinner. And he said their two best buildings are the Lyric Theatre in Belfast and the Glucksman Theatre uh, in Cork. And he also mentioned an unbuilt project, which you may see today, I don't know, the Photographer's Gallery in London. And they're interested in craft, place, and the social. Coincidentally and poignantly, I also found out that Neil, when he was um, talking to his nomination at the RIBA, raised a toast to, to Sir Ath and said some words and was um, <clears throat> spoken to after the dinner by a number of people who wanted to um, acknowledge the passing of, of Sir Ath. Finally, a recent quote in the Guardian newspaper referred to John and Sheila as, if I get it right, poets, the poets of concrete and the magicians of brick. So let's get on with the show. Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey. Thanks, Nick. Very good. Um, we're really, really delighted to be here this morning in front of an audience of architects from all over the world. We've never been in this part of the globe before, so we felt that we should account for ourselves. So we're going to talk a bit about where we've come from, about where we're going, about themes in our work, rather than any kind of detailed description of individual buildings. Uh, for the purposes of this, we felt uh, because we wanted to be clear and we wanted to make sure we kept ourselves to the time. So we've actually written our lecture and we're going to read it and I hope you don't mind that. Um, there's a traditional form of performed conversation, an Irish form of conversation called an agalib berta, which is a conversation that takes place between two people, usually a man and a woman, who take turns to speak. So we see this as a kind of agalib berta. We've chosen six headings to structure our thoughts, and we'll each talk three times. Um, and the first heading is Everything Accumulates. Each project contributes something to the way in which we approach our work. Projects accrue and build one on another, and they're not discreet. Ideas and methods pile up. We hoard them. Nothing is wasted. The starting point for each new work builds on all the work we've already done. It's a slow, continuous, enfolding business. On the one hand, architecture is a clearly defined discipline with its own rules and its own inherent logic. But it's so complex and so much a part of life and living that it's influenced by and accommodates and maybe even contains many other aspects of human creativity and ingenuity. 
we think it extends beyond itself in a number of ways. The presence or, or effect of a building reaches further than its physical boundaries, outside the limits of its site to the world beyond, at least until it meets the buildings and spaces that surround it or the landscape that defines it. In the recently completed student centre for the London School of Economics, it's through its form and its designed landscape, it extends to make a new space between the existing buildings on its tight urban campus. In a less material way, architecture extends to embrace other art forms and disciplines. When David Chipperfield invited us to contribute to his common ground Venice Biennale in, I think it was 2012, we decided to show that our common ground includes works of poetry, sculpture, prose, photography, geometry. So we gathered together works by others, works that have affected and influenced us, a collection of what we call our affinities. And then we displayed them in a case facing a shelf of study models made in our studio of some of our architectural affinities. We wanted to record and extend the conversation, even the silent conversation, between those affinities and with us. And these affinities have become an integral part of our work. At the same time, in another corner of the Giardini, in that Biennale, we filled a box with found things, with stones, shells, functional artefacts, pigments, tools of our trade, with souvenirs, keepsakes, chapels, shrines and landscapes recorded in maps and sketches. This box had been sent to us by Todd Williams and Billy Chen from New York with the invitation to make an installation that was not our own professional work, but which comprised, as they said, things that speak to you and the work you do. Unlike the affinities, these aren't works of art, but objects which have taken on significance through use, through observation, or through our own act of appropriation. Projects by other people are also a part of the base out of which our work is made. Some things stay in the mind and we eventually take ownership of them, like Cannes' Escherich House, that we first learned about from Shane de Blackham as part of our first year teaching on the essentials of architecture in University College Dublin. Or this little studio in Chelsea with its asymptotic junctions, this funny curvy corner, which is a word we hadn't heard before, designed by our teacher and mentor Edward Jones in London. The London schools of Cahoon and Miller, the giant columns of Aldo Rossi's Galaritesi housing in Milan, and of course Jim Sterling's red buildings, and all of Corb, are in there near the bottom of this rich compost. These are all part of our work and of our life in architecture. The concrete stairs in Williams and Chen's Folk Art Museum, recently demolished by MoMA in New York, may not still physically exist on West 53rd Street, but it absolutely abides with us and in the world of architecture, and there it will survive. So ours is an art that's not, that is physical and metaphysical, material and spiritual. Even misremembered places and buildings can become real and vital in our remembering. When we designed this primary school in the Georgian context of Dublin suburb of Ranla, which had a basic brief for eight classrooms, two offices and a play hall, it offered us a wonderful opportunity to reflect on type, typology, repetition, difference, order, on institutions, community, neighborhood and the everyday. And these things then are dug into the mix and they become part of the next project, even when its subject is apparently quite different. Turanyi is not just interesting for his rigorous rationalism, but also for what he does with it and to it. How he makes his own of the type, he plays it and stretches it in plan and elevation and in three dimensions. Those steps pushed up against the pure, complete form of the Casa del Fascio to get you in, they're vernacular and human and timeless. They both affirm and challenge the purity and perfection of the abstract box. <clears throat> this grounding in the everyday, this remembering and celebrating of ordinariness and specialness of a threshold, lifts this work above an intellectually satisfying exercise and into what we call the space for architecture. When we came back to Dublin, after five or six years in London, 
we thought we might build small-scale, socially useful civic buildings in Irish towns. As we left London, a good friend had told us, half-jokingly, go back and change the face of Irish architecture. And half-jokingly, we held on to this as a kind of idealistic dream. We were inspired by the idea that architecture could have a role in defining a society, and we came back to Ireland to find ourselves in a society undergoing great cultural and social change. The arts, especially theatre, seemed to reflect the rapid developments occurring. Everything was in flux, and it was possible and indeed necessary to contribute to the discussion and be part of the change. There was no work for young architects, but there was plenty to think about. The physical fabric of Dublin was decaying and neglected. No one lived downtown. The docks had moved further out, leaving a huge, empty area of land and abandoned buildings. We felt we had a mission to bring European urbanism and city living to Dublin. So we got involved. Over 10 years, in different groupings of like-minded contemporaries, we made proposals and counter-proposals for how Dublin might develop. As the City Architecture Studio, we designed a master plan for the Docklands, which is shown here, to demonstrate that 10,000 people could live there. Everyone in Dublin said we were completely mad that no one would ever choose to live in the city, and particularly in that part of the city. But in London, the Architects' Journal published the project in full, and they put us on their cover in October 1984. Later, as Group 91, we made a series of strategic and detailed proposals at different scales. We finally won the Temple Bar Framework Competition in 1992, for uh, a framework plan for a historic part of the city, which was decayed and threatened with major um, demolition. So we felt uh, it was a case of poacher turned gamekeeper. And together, the eight young practices that comprised Group 91 built Dublin's cultural quarter over a period of six years. But while we were busy redesigning the city before we won Temple Bar, we lived off teaching and small projects. We learned to think strategically and experientially at the same time. We realized that a house needs an urban strategy and a city block needs intimate space. That you have to make the work you believe in and you have to stick with it. When Group 91 won that competition, John and I had already been working for four years on the site next door on the design of the Irish Film Centre. This was our first public project and our first experience of working with an existing building. The project reused and added to nine existing structures at the centre of a city block in Dublin, which had previously been the headquarters of the Quaker Religious Society of Friends. And in responding to existing buildings, what we realised then is that you inevitably work on strategy and detail together from the very beginning. You're brought right up against the essentials of architecture, material, light, texture, construction. These are all part of your initial thinking. Now, in this case, the accumulation was in place before we intervened. Rather than composing, we were orchestrating, working to bring order and meaning to a set of structures and geometries which chance and accident had gathered together. Now, that experience profoundly affected how we work. Since then, we haven't really distinguished between projects for new buildings and reworkings. It's just a matter of degree. All sites contain marks and evidence of cultivation or use. We're always working in the context of existing conditions. These conditions are just more evident when a build structure is part of the site. Um. Uh, Nick, in his introduction, kindly referred to our um, recent uh, recipi that we're recently recipients of the Royal Gold Medal in London. I mean, just actually this day last week. So forgive us for still being recovering from that. Um, and let me say something because I know that audience is full of architects. That um, to be honest, when you win an award as an architect. It's because you've applied for it, if you know what I mean. So, so there's only two sensations associated with um, competitions or awards in architecture, because it's self-inflicted. One is losing, for which you are very well prepared because you have entered the damn thing yourself. 
and the other is winning, which the main feeling of winning is the relief of not losing, <laughs> um, uh, as you know. Um, but in the case of the Royal Gold Medal, there is no such uh, place to put it because you, you don't apply for it, you don't expect it. There is no shortlist, there's no punishment, nobody suffers, um, you win it. Last year at Joseph Rickworth's Royal Gold Medal Lecture of Acceptance at the RIBA, we learned that John Ruskin, on being offered the Royal Gold Medal by the RIBA, reacted with a prompt refusal. Ruskin, according to Rickworth, at least on this occasion, chose sacrifice. Um, Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture was the book my father gave me when I was at the beginning of my studies in architecture. And in the opening chapter, The Lamp of Sacrifice, Ruskin makes every effort to distinguish mere building from the meaning of architecture. He reasonably admits that there can be no good architecture which is not based on good building. Well, we would agree with that. But then he goes on to say that to keep our ideas of building and architecture distinct from each other, we must understand fully that architecture concerns itself only with those characters of an edifice which are above and beyond its common use. Well, we couldn't agree with him there. You see, Ruskin believed that architecture can be measured only by that which is useless and unnecessary. And we ourselves would aspire towards an architecture of useful beauty. So two big differences arise straight away then between Ruskin and us, especially in regard to these important questions of architecture and sacrifice. Our uh, acceptance of this most unexpected honor from our respected peers at the RIBA, and our insistence that, at least for us, architecture is always going to be grounded in the everyday, albeit always aspiring to the what we might call the elevated ordinary. Or as the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney somewhere says, make your study the unregarded floor. Um, Virginia Woolf, answering her own question on how should one read a book, tells us that to read a book well, one should read it as if one were writing it. Begin not by sitting on the bench among the judges, but by standing in the dock with the criminal. Be his fellow worker, become his accomplice. Even if you wish merely to read books, begin by writing them. So standing as we are uh, here in the dock and still dealing with this out of the blue uh, gold medal, we hope you'll follow the advice of Virginia Woolf and begin not by sitting on the bench among the judges, at least for the length of this morning's short talk, but hear us out while we try to answer our own question on how should one approach an architect's work or to refine our intentions in this regard, still trusting in the audience as our accomplice, to tell you how we tend to approach certain aspects of this most privileged and complicated career. Let me read from a short quote from the Blue Guide to Mainland Greece. When we look for the origins of the Greek temple, we find that the setting comes first, long before the building a promontory, a spring of water, a cave, a grove of trees. Any unusual or life-giving phenomenon could seem to possess an unseen power. According to the Blue Guide, and please remember that this is a guide for all readers and not only for architects, there are three primary elements needed to define most ancient places of cult. The table that marks the spot, the perimeter that defines the setting, and the chamber that houses the goods. Greek architecture, as you all know, is all about the outside. It's about the vital presence of the object in the landscape. But if we were reading from a blue guide to the Byzantine, it would have been all about the interior luminous space. So imagine combining these two tendencies, the search for external presence and the exploration of internal volume from the concrete clarity of the foundations at Delphi to the brick-built mysteries of Hagia Sophia. And perhaps we could be seen as more Greco-Byzantine in our own spiritual origins and not be starting out our lecture here in Auckland, wrongly perceived as some kind of roving Irish regionalists. 
Um, this, I mean, in certain cases, where we can, we start with the site, like the Greeks. This is the site for the Glucksmann Gallery at the University College Cork, with the river cutting through a limestone landscape. We worked our way upwards and outwards out of the ground of this site. And the project, which began in plan and developed in section as a consequence of that first move, and then the form developed in a non-linear way or in a series of jumps from the first line drawn as if in the sand, and in this case helped by leaning on Seamus Heaney's 12-line poem about a mystical ship in the air. So for this secluded riverside site, our first thoughts were to keep all the trees and to lift the gallery up into the air above the limestone escarpment, to turn the plan on itself as if the plan itself was looking from within at selected views of the college in one direction or views back out towards the city um, and along and not across the river. The Kluxman Gallery has a void at the center of its at the center of its section. And that void is really a, an inverted courtyard. It's pushed up from underneath. And that inner aspect of its section is visible in the external form of its architecture. Um, in the Irish language culture centre in Derry in the north of Ireland, we wanted to work our way contrarywise um, outwards from within a landlocked um, infill site. And here the courtyard is really imagined as a residual volume that might remain after the extraction of a imagined medieval tower house. So it's a solid spatial volume rather than a negative void. And the plan is designed to, you see how restricted its site is by obstacles all around. And the plan is designed to try to open up a processional route, not only in the plan, but through the volume of the building. So we imagined our restriction in the same way that you might think of a pinball machine and the people passing from within it as if they are propelled by incidents that they encounter on their three-dimensional journey. Um, this idea of overlapping spaces, overlooking spaces, um, continues in the internal public streetscape of the Lyric Theatre that we built in Belfast, also in the north of Ireland. Um, at the very centre of this internal, wishing it was external streetscape, is another project entirely, which is the acoustic shell of the theatre auditorium. Um, it's making an auditorium to try to embody a kind of active interdependence between the techniques of theatre, the role of the actors, the presence of the audience, the sound in your ear, um, and making a building that in its external expression is trying to speak directly back in the, in the vernacular of Belfast brick, angular, testy, temperament and making a inside of the building open itself out towards the river down across the landscape um, to extend from within to without. Um, at the moment in Budapest we hope to combine some of these aspects of these previous projects, aspects of civic building, university life, accessible culture in a project that will in three phases extend across half a city block um, in the World Heritage Streetscape of Budapest. And this is the first phase of that project just started on site now for um, a, a new entrance to the university on the Grand Street of Nador Utsa in the, in the beautiful city of Pest, where balconies and bay windows and big cornices loom out over the building line and exuberant existing elevations directly adjoin more restrained facades and in the first phase of our building, there's a library over a learning cafe over a, an auditorium on a visual axis with the, with the river Danube. And there are courtyards of five buildings. The three of them will be, are old and two of them will be new, all three-dimensionally interconnected through their volumes to create social spaces out of the old buildings for 
student and academic life in step or in rhythm with this beautiful city of itself of courts and passageways. The scheme by connecting all these courtyards and by proposing new courtyards in places where light is needed is intended to make a integrally, a kind of a self relate, self integrated campus which by its self integration works its way out of the labyrinth of the academia out back onto the lively urban realm of Budapest it, itself. In our world, the work of making architecture always includes making the public realm. And this applies as much to houses as it does to institutional buildings. So in this house in Dublin, in Hoth, the kitchen floor extends out to make a pattern on the outside space which is dug out of the garden on this hilly site. We like buildings that aren't hermetic, sealed, smooth objects separated from their context or from the ground around them. We try to make buildings that don't hover or stand in distinct contrast, that have more complex relationships with ground and air, where there's an exchange between place and building, inside and outside, which has come up, I think, in every talk since we arrived here yesterday evening, uh, between old and new. And this phenomenon, this kind of interchange, exists in time as well as in place, in spirit as well as in fabric. Working on designs for a number of schools, we developed a way of thinking about the relationship between inside and outside, using intermediate, even indeterminate space to prolong the experience of entering or leaving. The standard Irish brief for a primary school has very strict floor area controls and it has no allowance for social space. But we found we could enrich the spatial catalogue by including the world outside within the orbit of the building. External spaces that are part of the architecture but not sealed from the elements aren't counted in the calculation of floor area. So when we make covered verandas, steps and platforms, porches, these allow the building in a way to expand and they allow for some ambiguity about the state of being either inside or outside. They extend the architecture beyond the door. We're interested in contingent, even non-committal spaces where the decision to enter can be eased or postponed. I think it's something to do with, we have an interest in the kind of psychological effect of buildings and that buildings can intimidate people and people can feel afraid to go in a door. So we think it's interesting that you might make a place where someone can sort of stop and pause and not feel challenged and make a decision whether to take the step of entering the building or not. This school in Ranla is on a small urban site, a little, a little city, suburban city block. The school builds its site using cut and fill to negotiate the level change. The site is divided almost exactly in half between the building and a constructed yard. The veranda, which was in the previous photo, elaborates the boundary between the two conditions. The dug-in yard flows under it, staff rooms and offices project into it, and in section it cranks to define the roof terrace above. On the street side of the school, a brick wall is built hard against the boundary to protect the classrooms from the noise of passing traffic. At above eye level, the brick enclosure cuts back to provide shallow courts for light and air and outside space for classrooms, and in response to the domestic scale of the neighboring houses. The Hudson House, a small dwelling dug into and rising out of a narrow stepped site in the middle of the small town of Navan, was designed at the same time as that school in Ranla, and some of the same concerns were on our minds. In this case, the change in site level was much more dramatic. The garden is a full story higher than the street. And in this house, inside and outside spaces overlap, leading from an archway in the street through to the raised garden level that looks back over the town. The clients ran a busy restaurant in the street front building, and the site for their new house was a backyard and garden behind. The yard was in the shell of a ruined concrete shed 
whose walls retained the earth of the surrounding gardens. And when we met them, they were already living a kind of inside-outside life, or that was our observation. They lived in an apartment above the restaurant, and they took most of their meals during breaks from the hot kitchen at a table in the open-air ruin of the rough concrete yard. So we designed and then had built their new house around the life they were already living in this particular place. I mean, probably in this country it's normal for people to eat outside and spend a lot of time outside, but in Ireland it was very unusual to find people living this kind of life. So we proposed to them that their new house would retain this sense of outdoors and indoors being overlapped, and this is Patricia and her daughter in their new house uh, not long after it was built. The plan of the house, a bit like the, the Irish language centre John showed, is a very long, narrow building hemmed in on two sides. So it's a rectangle divided in two and slipped. The forecourt pushes part of the living room out into the yard, creating a matching pocket space that slows and shelters the movement from living room to court. So, sorry, the forecourt here leads into the living room, which is then pushed out, making this recess with the big door. The courtyard and outdoor space then leads across to the bedroom tower on this side. Across the court here is, so the bedrooms, hmm. This is a three-story tower of bedrooms on this side of the court. So there's no covered connection from the living room to the bedrooms. And yet, this house is still one building. The enclosing walls and floor of the living rooms extend into and across the court. One wall turns up to form the gable of the bedroom tower. Another, so the floor runs up into the tower stairs run up to the garden. The architecture and the side walls unite the building as one, although you have to go outside to move from living room to bedroom. The courtyard is a room in the house and a space in the town. The house was built in two construction phases. The concrete shell, which retains the site edges and defines the spatial enclosure, was built by a specialist contractor in just six weeks. Then there was a delay before a local house builder installed timber floors, partitions, doors and windows to turn the structure into a house. And during that pause, the distinction between inside and outside seemed unclear. The house hovered between ruin and construction, coming and going, domestic and civic. The clients held a candlelit party with hay bales for furniture and learned to love the empty space of their future home. This one-off design, which was such a particular response to its unusual site conditions and its client's life, has turned out to be our most generic project. Many subsequent projects have built on and developed the spatial and constructional ideas contained in this small building. The Glucksmann Gallery, um, the way that the movement is through and under the building, is closely related to the spatial strategy of the Hudson House. St. Angela's College, a school currently on site in Cork, is a greatly expanded version of this world of over and under and in between. It too is on a landlocked street urban site. New interventions manoeuvre their way down the hill, passing between existing historic buildings. A continuous external route runs from the top to the bottom, negotiating the 18-metre drop in site level, connecting courts, gardens and playgrounds. The social housing scheme in Richmond Hill, also in Cork, turns the Hudson House into the Greek hill town that it always wanted to be. In Dublin, uh, we've built, finished a few years ago, a social housing project called Timberyard which was really, um, I suppose, a conscious effort to try and build a little piece of Dublin using, to an extent, the language and scale of the existing city, but in a new way transformed to deal with a brief for 50 small uh, social housing units um, for rent by Dublin City Council. So we really tried to um, modulate the architecture to enhance and enrich the lives people live there. Uh, the, enclosing, the brick enclosing walls 
have recessed porches, double height terraces and projecting bay windows to give a sense of depth and urban complexity to the building's edge and to provide an interface between the private world of the house and the local neighbourhood. This kind of transitional space brings the outside world into the domestic realm by framing it as a borrowed landscape while holding it out by means of the protective depth of enclosing walls. The site, uh, the site is on a, a, f a busy uh, new street, which is being a street cut through the city by Dublin City Council. So our project makes a kind of protected triangular space um, using the geometry of the existing streets, parallel to existing streets, to give you this enclosed pedestrian social space which belongs to the inhabitants of the project, which then works its way along the public street and back in to connect up with existing housing elsewhere. In a way, this, this kind of transitional space that we're trying to make, this layered deep space between a residence and the public realm by a porch or by a terrace, acts like a zoom lens, allowing the occupants to adjust their relationship with the boundaries of their domestic territory. Heidegger said, a boundary is not that at which something stops, but as the Greeks recognized, the boundary is that from which something begins its presencing. In this case, the triangular court has a narrow opening to Cork Street, which slows and quietens the city behind. Projecting staircases, recessed alcoves, seats and trees populate the space and make it a kind of campo, an occupied room. A slipped pattern of domestic scaled windows suggests occupation by many people. Double height lodges mark the location of each individual apartment and give a larger scale rhythm to the facade. The brick surface steps and angles around corners to make an unbroken enclosure, turning into the timber yard, crossing the floor of the yard itself before making its way back out to the street where it joins in urban continuity with the ubiquitous streetscape of the Liberties. The photographer's gallery in Soho in London, which um, is tucked away down a narrow lane off Oxford Street, it's a vertical extension of a brick warehouse and it's clad in a dark render overcoat that steps forward from the facade of the existing brickwork like a close fitting camera case. The north light periscope window is a single eye looking out over, this, is this big window here, looking out over and framing the skyline, a sentinel visible from the surrounding city. Sean O'Casey Community Centre in Dublin has a strong presence at the edge of the Dublin Docklands. It's a defined symbol of the existence of this vibrant old working class community in the middle of a newly commercialized neighborhood full of industrial, um, sorry, financial institutions and big banks. The plan here shown is divided into four quarters for childcare, age care, sports and drama. So we designed the building as a single story courtyard to um, accommodate these very particular and in a way, a delicate uses of looking after old people and children. But the, um, the clients, the community group, wanted a big building. They wanted something very visible on the skyline. So we designed a small tower of meeting rooms whose windows are floating skywards. And this, this image is actually the Christmas card we sent out uh, the year we finished the building. And you might see that in one of the windows at the top we have um, the moon with um, Santa and his sleigh going across the, the window in the night sky. Um, but that tower of meeting rooms rises out of an inward looking courtyard building, which is designed, as I said, to provide this kind of protected environment with a series of gardens, one attached to each of the uses of childcare, old people, sports and drama. Um, so this and this building, this uh, courtyard building, protects and shelters the daily activities of old people and of children and of sportsmen. And then the exterior is wrapped in this corrugated concrete with these circular windows. And these materials and this expression came out of early conversations we had with the local people about ships and silos and the silent sheds of their collective memory, their familiar Docklands landscape.
We want to make our buildings feel permanent. Our intention is to make a lasting thing, robust and ready for long and useful life in the world. I think that's why we like to work with raw materials, with the archaic stuff that will weather naturally and wear out slowly. Um, we like brick, concrete, timber. Those materials seem to offer some kind of aesthetic resistance. They are uh, resilient to time and to season. But for the builder, um, this makes his life a little more difficult. Because the structure is the first thing to be made, and in the mostly wet and often windy outdoor conditions of a building site, and then these, these primary elements have to be protected through all the messy stages of construction. And these primary elements eventually emerge as the precious finish. So the first thing made becomes the first thing visible in a world where final finishes can't conspire to cover up early work. Um, this is difficult to achieve in real life, and sometimes we have suffered or we have seen a well-made piece of work suffer from the untimely drop of a scaffold pole or a belt from the end of a passing ladder. But the builder is a necessary part of the team, and the builder has to feel part of the family that's working together to make a good building. Architects must be ready to praise the work and learn to love the man who is doing his best. So let me quote from Rilke, who in his efforts to seek out his own space for poetry, told his patron princess to praise this world to the angel. Let me read the following few words extracted from Rilke's ninth elegy. So show him something simple, which formed over generations lives as our own, near our hand and within our gaze, Tell him of things. He will stand astonished as you stood by the rope makers in Rome or the potters along the Nile. We could translate Rilke's lyrical advice to send praise to the angel to more practical but no less poetic ends. Architects should speak directly to their clients, to their contractors, to their tradesmen, talking simply about qualities near our hand, qualities that inhere in what Rilke liked to call things, or what we call buildings. Architecture is a craft-based art. The architect's concept has to be carried across to live in the building itself. And this transference, this uh, translation, is realized through the active commitment of the contractor and the measured skill of manual work. Bricklayers, carpenters, shuttering contractors, site engineers, general foremen are the unsung actors that make actual architecture out of architects' intentions. These are the people worth talking to, worth taking into our confidence, whose advice is worth listening to. Uh, we know that ideas are born in the mind, but architects' ideas live on in the practical, poetical things we call buildings. Or, as Dennis Lasden said, you can go and see it, and the building, if it has anything to say, will have to speak for itself. Professional training inclines our profession away from the view that, or towards the view, maybe I should say, that craftsmanship is a thing of the past. And by this way of thinking, architectural design should avoid the demands of difficult construction, and instead it ought to provide for the norms of the industry, as if the building process could be or should be reduced to the assembly or some kind of assembly of standardized components. But on the contrary, we found that the whole construction team can rise to the satisfaction of a difficult job done well. And we have had the good fortune to work with master craftsmen and with very careful colleagues in the studio who attend to the discipline of their craft at every stage in the difficult journey from design to completion. And then, strangely enough, it seems that the more difficult the challenge, the better the chances of getting the work done well. This is one further reason for us to try to approach simplicity through complication, because if it's too easy to do, no one seems to think it's worth trying to do it particularly well. We practice our own craft through a studio-based way of working. First thoughts are sketched out in soft pencil and then quickly drawn up on computer and then roughly modelled in 
cardboard and then the process is repeated on a daily basis and designs are gradually developed with overlay drawings on A3 size sheets of skitson paper. And there's nothing novel in this routine. It's the technique that we both learned at Jim Sterling's office. It's the means by which fluency emerges, continuous in many respects with the methods of student project work. And sometimes, on a good day, a mysterious jump in thinking happens when the work itself is in flow. So constant practice in the studio helps to, to develop a surer sense of scale and some practical experience on site helps to keep the, mind, the mind's eye and the hand's action connected to each other. Working closely with trusted colleagues in the studio and cooperating repetitively with expert consultants is one of the tangible benefits of professional practice. And unlike in college life, where the hard question always seems to be why, in practice more often the interesting question is simply how. This is the craftsman's question, and the search for an adequate answer can open up directions for collaborative investigation into the capacities of material and the methods of construction. So the technology of communication has changed um, completely in our generation. And the principles of the tools of the trade have changed somewhat less. And the raw materials of construction have changed very little. The really big change in building technology happened long ago. It happened by the end of the 19th century with the separation of structural frame from enclosing fabric. Walls these days are no longer monolithic. Weight no longer requires massive thickness for its support, and buildings provide their adequate protection from the weather in purpose-specific layers of construction. And that is the breakthrough that, after countless centuries of masonry-based building, brought about the revolution in 20th century aesthetics of construction. But nowadays, this news is no longer new. Timber, as always, is a scarce resource, requiring management at source and maintenance in use. It's still sawn in planks. It's joined in sections to allow for movement along and across its grain. And the technology of glass and steel, amazing as it is in its complexity and in its refinement, but the difference is in degree, not in kind. Bricks have changed not at all. 175,000 bricks for the LSE Student Centre were each individually made from clods of clay, uh, extracted from the flo forest floor in the Forest of Dean, hand thrown into wooden moulds, like these actual wooden moulds, sprinkled with coloured sand, baked in the oven like loaves of bread. And construction sites then are social settings, settings where the social art of architecture takes on its physical substance. And the quality of craftsmanship is always ready, like Rilke's angel, to be recognized with human respect at every stage, from setting out to finishing off. So this section is called Building Ground, but maybe it might also be about plans and maps. Um, for us, Plans have always been the starting point for our work. In a way, our plans have become more complex over our 25 years of practice, but maybe they're also getting more simple and more intuitive. Um, we started out with order and geometry and rigor with absolutes. And those things are still there, but now the plans are also about movement, direction and balance, and they're always about use and occupation. Life, experience and building have all worked on and over the order. We've stretched and pulled the geometry. We're not afraid now to bend and angle walls in response to multiple forces acting on us and of place, of climate, of program. And we recognize that very many, some apparently unlikely factors influence our work or some experiences we've had in our life somehow feed into the work we make, and I'm going to talk about some of those in this section. We like to use words to clarify design ideas. We try to pin down complexities by capturing them in carefully chosen phrases. Driving through a Finnish forest on a pilgrimage to see Alto's work for the first time, John started one of his many Alto limericks with the lines, 
In his late church work, Alto was anti. Any walls that were straight, he liked slanty. But so sometimes silly words are actually very serious, and the material quality and responsive spatial character of those churches and houses of Alto's had a profound effect on us and on our work. T.S. Eliot says that the naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. For me, picking up the right stone on a beach is a difficult matter. While it's not easy to define, the selection method has become more certain over time. I favor stones of similar shape or those of common color, but also some erratic stones that fit in only by standing out. The most interesting ones have strong forms shaped by the forces of nature. They feel complete. They can't be added to or subtracted from. The critical selection of a handful of stones could be compared to editing words in a phrase. They're turned over, they're scrutinized, and most are rejected. Drawing or painting the gathered stones gives us ownership of their form. It fixes them on the surface and in our minds. So I'm continuously drawing and observing stones and other things in nature as part of a kind of catalog of objects which are fed into the work. So collecting and grouping things in this way is part of the preparation for the eventual assembly of parts in a building, for the ordering and balancing of dimensions and densities, of heavy and light, of solid and ephemeral phenomena. Our interest isn't just in the physical characteristic of objects, it's in how the material qualities of things can influence deeper thoughts about life and use relating to more profound and perhaps even metaphysical aspects of architecture, to how we experience things. On the day that we heard we'd won the LSE competition, we were on holidays, and I picked up these three angular red stones on a beach otherwise full of smooth white round stones. Those LSE-specific stones jumped out of that familiar background, and the gap between noticing and making was suddenly diminished. Why do stones matter? Because they are matter. They have their own material quality. They show the marks of time, altered by weather and affected by water. They embody characteristics of the place they come from. They're part of the ground we live on and the stuff we build with. We spend hours observing steps and seats outside the doors of archaic Greek chapels, noticing the singular quality of small sacred spaces and how they're anchored to the earth. Roof and walls making one continuous surface. Sometimes the chapel is half swallowed by a rock face. Layers of whitewash unify the form. Low enclosing walls combine with seats and steps to act as skirting and plinth. The built ground is integrated with the building form. Maps and plans are also part of the thought process. Drawing over Nolly's beautiful plan of Rome with each day's route through the city drawn in a different colored pencil records our path, as well as recording the fact that we don't move through the same places in the same way each time. Our feet lead us, we mark that route on the map, and then the map itself suggests alternative routes, so it leads us too. The drawn over map stakes out our Rome as a thing in itself. By acting on the map, we claim the city. A few years ago, on those same Greek island holidays, I started to make swimming maps. Every day, I'll swim into the harbor, lining myself up with a cave on the headland opposite, or a moored fishing boat, or a peak on a distant mountain. Then I mark the route I've taken on the map I'm making. The map changes and develops with each swim. The swims develop in response to the map. I see myself because of making the map, I see myself suspended in an aquatic space between the fishing boats. This swimming map unites objects and space. It makes the space between things, it maps the space between things that aren't quite static. So the space isn't static either, it's liquid. Space separates things, defining and measuring, measuring the gaps between objects, but it is also a thing in itself. It shifts between positive and negative, between concrete and abstract. Describing the process of making a set of beautiful maps of the west of Ireland, Tim Robinson said, while walking the land, 
I am the pen on the paper. While drawing this map, my pen is myself walking the land. Plans of buildings are also maps. They chart experience, culture and occupation. But a plan of a building as you design it is anticipating the future rather than describing the present and the past. The act of marking maps, of following our feet, fixes certain spatial conditions in our minds. That's why we bring our life experience into our studio work. What we're doing is building a world, or trying to project a new place in the old world. The LSE Student Centre plan is directly influenced by these experiences and observation. The plan embodies movement, space flows freely in horizontal plan and vertical section, with the stairs slowly twisting and turning around the fixed vertical element of the lift shaft, a bit like swimming around a boat in the harbour. The folded faceted facade here responds to the rights of light restrictions, which Elizabeth talked about earlier. In this case, um, we didn't want to make a building full of setbacks that were set down by the legal uh, conditions we were given, so we canted and angled the walls. And then the form we were making was also tailored in response to views down the approaching lanes and alleys. Our concept for this building was street life. The London School of Economics the campus is a little corner of um, London medieval street, street uh, networks. It doesn't have an enclosed campus, it is the city. So we had the idea that the network of lanes that defines that campus continues into the building, winding up and through the floors in the form of the big generous staircase connecting the various levels. The building is anchored to its site while pulling away from its edges to make an entrance forecourt at the front and courts for light and air at the back. The sur surface of the skin was cut out along fold lines to form large areas of glazing and to define the entrance forecourt. When the building was almost complete, we were commissioned by Westminster City Council to design the public realm. So we continued the brick floor of the entrance hall and the geometry of the plan out into the paving of the street. The canopy provides a gathering space, an in-between space between the public realm and the building. The LSE campus had absolutely no social outdoor space for students, so by making this small covered space, it in such a tight urban context, it gives a sense of generosity, although it is quite small. And then the continuation of the surfaces and materials of the building out into the street expands the building's apparent area beyond its, its own enclosure. And this indoor-outdoor campus street life continues through to the foyer and all the way up the open stair to the rooftop cafe. to conclude with the future perfect. No matter how many times you return to look out from your Roman holiday hotel window, the Pantheon's portico stoically stands its ground, indifferent to your admiring gaze. The day begins at a carefully chosen spot at the usual cafe counter, chosen with care to allow you to divide your attentions between drinking a morning espresso and keeping the old brick elephant in clear view out of the corner of your eye. Last grappa of the evening is taken at the properly named Tempio Bar, right opposite the lit up Pantheon, most impressively timeless at this hour, at any hour, at any time. At times like this, the much copied original reminds you, if only superficially, of a well-worn image of itself, and at the same time, more fundamentally, of all of the origins of civic architecture. The Pantheon holds its canonical place in the architectural Pantheon, its endurance impervious to the many changes and various continuities that have provided the conditions for its unconditional survival through 2,000 years. An architectural form full of pagan history, passively resistant to Christian ritual, burial place of the divine Raphael. It is today mostly appreciated for its existential presence, its aura, as Rilke would have it. The simple wonder of an ancient, empty vessel wide open to the elements, suddenly made manifest to our own senses through the spectacle of its oculus, 
by columns of solid sunlight slanting across the shell of its concrete ceiling or by showers of rain power washing its sloping floor. Brick, concrete, and stone. The whole heavy structure facing north, its X axis extending out onto the public ground of the adjoining piazza, its Y axis leading up into the open air of the heavens above. This once was, and somehow it still remains, a brand new building, disruptively radical in its intentions, dazzlingly inventive in its construction, belonging intrinsically to its place and promising further possibilities beyond its physical limits. We had come to Epidaurus in the hope of catching an evening performance, some unspecified and hopefully surtitled Greek tragedy. And at the ticket office, they apologized because postponed due to last year's forest fires, tonight there'd be a special show of Beckett's Happy Days. We were lucky enough to witness Fiona Shaw's Winnie heroically struggling to maintain her optimism. Here in the theater of the round at Epidaurus, buried up to her waist and then up to her neck at the epicenter of ancient drama. Beckett's classic 20th century theater of the absurd adopted to its archetypal setting, owls hooting in the trees, other animals sounds off, seen against a black starry backdrop and a rising moon and Winnie telling herself, oh, this is a happy day. This will have been another happy day after all so far. We could interpret Winnie's repeated reliance on the future perfect as somehow analogous to the way an architect designing has to think about time, suspended as he is, as she was suspended between the past and the future. To envisage a project having any sense of permanence in its built reality, you have to push your mind forward to an unspecified point in the imagined past of a fictional future, and from that precarious vantage point, look back over the likely lasting consequences of any actions you are about to propose in the immediate present. That's one meaning of the word project, used as a verb, meaning to propel. Even the grand old pantheon must once have seemed disruptively new in ancient Rome. And we have seen the contemporary archaic drama of happy days brought to new sense via an Arcadian engagement with ancient architecture and living nature. New and old are not really adequate or even relevant terms to describe the purposeful vitality of architecture. The future perfect is a progressive tense. It's a useful position from which to fortify the proposition of any particular design, to rehearse some of its more difficult parts, or perhaps to seize the moment to change your mind to start again, to fail again, to fail better, as Beckett says. We shouldn't be persuading ourselves into a fool's paradise of an impossibly perfect future. We should be reminding ourselves again and again, by way of the future perfect, of the more complex, the more complex dimensions of what will have been, of the imperfect reality, of the present continuous, of the living present. Sheila began this talk with the idea that everything accumulates. This drawing, showing some of our projects at the same scale as each other, is titled Composite Functions, Compatible Plans Connected. Composite functions is a mathematical term that applies one function to the results of another to produce a third, or like in the song, them dry bones, where the hip bones connected to the thigh bone. We wanted to bring some different schemes together to see how they might link up to make some sort of continuity between themselves. So starting at the top right, the vessel we made for the Venice Biennale is a seeing device lodged in the Cyclops eye of the photographer's gallery in London and the gallery is spliced back to back with the Glucksmann gallery whose river viewing window is hooked up to the sea viewing window in the Hoth house. And the gable of this private house is attached to the gable of the timber yard social housing. And the other end of the LSE student center continues the brick wall around the corner until the cafe of the LSE flows over into the cafe of the Lyric Theater, 
whose own backstage is now back to back with the backstage of the Irish Language Cultural Centre, etc., etc., making one continuous city out of all these damn small different buildings. And somehow the LSE Student Centre sits happily at the centre of this, all this unconscious interactivity between 25 years of our work. After all, so far. Thank you.